review board administrator in the Department of Planning and Development. With me is uh, Lily Iagazu, who is a principal planner in the Zoning Administration Division, and Grace Davenport, who is a heritage resource planner in our group as well. So tonight we're going to talk about three things. Um, one is the finalizing the um, county facilitated poll on behalf of the Homes for an Acre Civic Association. The other one is an update to the timeline. And then the final thing that we're going to be talking about is the boundaries. So at um, our last work group meeting, we went over the poll questions. Um, and we kind of landed on two questions along with a comment box. Um, the first question was essentially, um, you all were interested in finding out how informed uh, the larger community felt about this process and about the historic overlay district for homes for an acres. And Sarah um, created this sliding scale that would allow people to um, you choose, you know, from not informed at all, all the way to very informed and keeping in mind that the um, public input page will, or the public input website will walk them through um, all sorts of uh, information about the historic overlay district before they actually get to the um, taking the poll. So um, that by the time they get to this point, they will have um, received a lot of information about this. So hopefully everybody can get to that 80 to 90 percent very informed um, side of this scale. Did anybody have any thoughts about this before I move on? And I'm I'm sorry, I'm again, I'm blind. So if I, you can just speak up, that would uh, help me. No, that looks good. Great. Thanks. OK, and then the second question is just an essentially an up or down vote. Uh, do you support the establishment of a historic overlay district for the Holmes Run Acres neighborhood? Yes, no and no opinion. Everybody. Denise, can you still hear me? Yes. Um, if, if we end up with a preponderance of no opinions, because I think sometimes when those things are you know, we talked about this, but I had a thought after our last meeting. When when that's offered, a lot of people just because they don't, you know, they're not in the mood to think about it, or they just really can't be bothered. That no opinion because it just feels like they're being neutral. What happens if that ends up being a really big portion of the vote? Does that get does that get considered as a yes, or does it, you know, does it require a revote, or how? What happens at that point? Um. I think we would report it as a no opinion. I mean, we would literally report the results that we receive. Right, but if we're looking for, I mean, I think to feel comfortable about moving ahead, we would want a majority yes vote, right? So if, if instead we end up with, you know, a few yeses, a few noes, and a majority no opinion, what, what happens to the process at that point? Right. Well, I mean, uh, the the poll isn't required for the county process. Um, the poll is something that the um, Civic Association wanted. So I, right. okay. you know, I, I if we end up with a preponderance of no's, I think that's going to be the real, <laughs> the real question. You know, then then do okay. we move forward? Um, but I, I would hope that after being fully informed and walking through that public input web page, if they have not been engaged throughout the process, um, taking the poll, looking at the public um, input, I mean, the design guidelines will be in there, the proposed boundaries will be in there, the list of contributing and non-contributing properties will be in there, um, frequently asked questions, right. all of those things. Um, I, I would I would just suspect that after a full review, um, no opinion, you're not going to land on no opinion. You're you're probably going to have an opinion or not. Um, and you're taking the poll. So, you, you know, there's right. a right. Yeah, there's a motivation there. OK, okay. Um, thank yeah. you. 
You're welcome. Did anybody have any other thoughts about the yes, no, or no opinion? Okay. My thought is that if anybody's going to bother to get as far as the poll, they're going to have an opinion one way or the other. Right. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of my thought, too. I'm going to stop sharing my screen quickly um, and show you all the public input page. Of course, I can't find my, I can't get back to it. Here it is. Um, one second, I want to show you the public input page so you see when I'm when I'm saying that we're going to go through this. They're going to have to go through this whole um, process. So the, the first is a letter from the supervisor um, or and that's something that I did want to talk to the uh, work group about um, the Holland Hills. Uh, public input page had a letter from the supervisor that um, opened and introduced this uh, this process in the poll process. And it might be something that the work group or the um, civic association would like to do as well. Uh, it's the cover of the poll, and I think it probably would be um, beneficial to have some sort of overarching statement um, and, and lay, laying the background of um, how we got to this point. So if you all want to start thinking about that, that was the cover of the um, Holland Hills public input page. And I would I would recommend probably having a cover letter for the Holmes Run Acres uh, public input page as well. So you, it starts with a letter from this. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't, I don't know how to, I guess I, I do know how to raise my hand. I, I'm sorry, I didn't do it. I should have hit star five. No, that's okay. Uh, I just, can't um, see you anyway when you raise your hand because I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. Okay. Well, this is the blind leading the blind then. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, so my question is, we don't, you know, we, we have this muddy situation where we're now being handed off to the third supervisor in the process of our pursuit of a historic overlay district. Linda Smith is the supervisor under whom we started. Yeah. Dahlia Paltrick took over, and now we've been redistricted, so we've got Penny Gross. How important is it that we have a supervisor, you know, uh, author this introduction? And do we do we ourselves author one, kind of put together the history, and have all three of the supervisors sign it? I'm not really sure if you have any insight on that. Right, I I think that would I mean I'm I'm sure that um you all can talk to talk amongst yourselves and you know yes Elise the the one was the 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 survey for the Holland Hills district was initiated by the supervisor, so it was logical for him to introduce the survey. If you all are more comfortable introducing it by the from the civic association or someone else, it, it's it's not required. Right, it's not, yeah. it's, it's not Penny's poll like it was Dan's poll. Got right, it. That's, okay. Yeah, well, that's exactly. Definitely what, have, I, go ahead. Okay. I've, I've kept notes and everything about, you know, how we got there. In fact, a lot of that's on our website. So it's pr probably pretty easy to pull together a short, um, in fact, I, I even have, a, you know, uh, on the website, a little short article about how, I think it's even titled, how'd we get, how'd we get here? Yeah. So, um, okay. So I think maybe that's what we'll do. We'll uh, offer it. I just I guess I wasn't sure if we should try to run it by the various supervisors and just see if it, you know if, if they wanted to. If that just I don't know if they, would they feel ostracized if they're not invited to introduce it or you know I'm, I'm not sure politically how how that would play. Sure, and I would I would recommend maybe talking amongst yourselves and maybe going back to the Civic Association. My understanding is that it's the Civic Association that has requested the poll. So perhaps the cover letter should come from the Civic Association. But if you wanted, you know, to have at least run it by the supervisor, uh, super, uh, Supervisor Gross, that might be a good idea as well. I really can't advise you, um, but I would I would recommend some kind of cover letter. And that is the Civic Association. Oh, hang on. 
The Civic Association, to my knowledge, is already working on uh, on a letter. Uh, Sarah might uh, speak to that, but it, it came up at, at our meeting a few weeks ago. Oh, thanks, David. That's great. OK, so that that the uh, the first thing is this cover letter, and I'm glad to hear that um, you all are thinking about it. Uh, the next thing was the background and boundaries, and that will be something that the staff provides. The next thing is um, the FAQs just frequently ask questions about historic overlay districts, the process, um, et cetera. And then the draft language for the zoning um, ordinance and the rezoning. The ARB process and all of these elements will be added um, in the next few weeks as uh, staff completes their work. And then the design guidelines. And again, you have to continue, you have to click through each page to get to the next page before you get to the actual poll. So here's where you enter your information. And here's the poll for Holland Hills. So Homes for Acres will look very similar to that. Okay. I'm going to go back to my presentation. Sorry, it takes me a minute. All right. Zoom slideshow. Here we go. Okay. So, so here, there's the 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 question. Um, the last, do you support the establishment? And then the next question is the comment box. If you'd like, please share why you are or are not in support of the historic overlay district for homes run acres. So very. Very simple um, and to the point. Okay. Is everybody feeling okay about those three questions? Yes, I am. Yeah, me too. Terrific. Okay. All right, on to the postcard updates then. OK, so the only thing that was changed on the front of the postcard was the um, respond respond by date. And we haven't set a date yet. We just have a um, August as the as the month. As a placeholder, but this is pretty much exactly what you saw the last time. OK, um, changes to the back. We um, added the suite number, which was missing uh, from the address. Um, we added uh, the general telephone number to the Department of Planning and Development. That was something that the work group asked for um, if people wanted to call to get um, paper copies or translation services, they can call that general number, the 324-1380, and either reach me or somebody in our group um, who can help them. We increased the size of the font just a bit um, because that was some feedback that we received. Um, Sarah looked into reducing the size of the QR code, but there are some limitations uh, for scanning the code. It really needs to be a size that the, count, the scanners can recognize. So um, she couldn't go too much smaller with the, with the QR code. Um, the one, oh, and then we did put in bold um, this last sentence, one poll response is permitted per property. So, um, and I think what we'll do is pull that onto a separate, that whole thing onto a separate line so it sort of stands out a little bit more than it does right now because it's wrapped around in that same paragraph. I the think the address oh, is a technically false church, sorry. 
I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, it says Anna Dillon is technically false church. Okay. Yeah. You say okay. that the uh, little blurb there on the right hand side is where people would call for a paper copy, but that doesn't say that. Oh, uh, I'm maybe they I don't see anywhere on oh there it is. A paper yeah. email. Okay. Okay. All right. down, down I'm there. looking at translation services. Yeah, I see it now. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it might take you you might actually have to read the postcard. Um hopefully people will be engaged enough to read the to read everything. Um, and especially if they want a paper poll, they'll be looking for, okay, how do I get a paper poll? And uh, thank you, Sarah, for pointing out the address. I think um, Sarah Godfrey probably just guessed, you know, I don't think she looked up the Holmes Run Acres address. No problem. Uh, this is a, a minor nit, but, um, but the... The question about requesting a paper poll might be confusing to someone reading it quickly because both poll and email can be a verb or a noun. Um, maybe a paper copy of the poll, comma, email. I don't know if that fits or not. It looks like there might be room because uh, the beginning of that sentence under, you know, starting with four, you can take over to you know, at least the where my name begins, Denise. So if you're just adding copy, that's only four or five. Well, if you add the comma to, I think you, I think we can fit it. I do see what you're saying. Denise, I also think that we can support once the ballots go out, we can support that with the website site and also blast it on the listserv. And there we can put a little bit more text and kind of sort of make a bullet says these are the three ways or whatever that you can, you know, um, take the poll. So we can we can kind of rev up the interest and also kind of do a FAQ on how to do it on the listserv. Great. That sounds great. Okay. Okay. Any more Thoughts about the postcard? Okay, so the major change that we did that we executed based on the work group's feedback is we completely removed the idea of using the tax map ID as the, um, the individual indicator. What we're going to do instead is use um, the IP addresses. So if you have, um, if you're taking the poll on your um, home internet, it will register you and you will be only allowed or be able to take the poll one time on your home internet. And we will be cross-checking that with your um, home addresses. So not that we have your IP addresses, but their duplicates will not um, be allowed. If you uh, use the same IP address, um, it will bump you out and ask you to um, enter a code to log in. So that's really important to know for people who might be helping other people take the poll. You won't you won't be able to enter um, other addresses using your IP address. So let me let me advance this slide and we'll talk about this a little bit. Okay. So what that means specifically is that if um, you all are helping a neighbor um, complete the poll, they they will need to mail in their copy or use their own internet address to um, to actually enter in their vote. You will not be able to use your they can't come to your house, let's say, and log in and enter their address because it's the IP address rather than the parcel number that is going to be the unique identifier. 
I have a question and a comment. First mm -hmm. of all, uh, thank you for taking our our comments into consideration. I think that removing the parcel ID will really improve the turnout and participation. I do have a concern, though, as there were uh, in our initial survey, there were a number of times where one member of the family voted and then the other member, the, another member of the household did not knowing that their spouse or child already had. And I was wondering if we could add just um, the property address as a as a question or a text box. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are going to be using the property address um, as our cross check for the IP addresses. Okay, so I was I was confused by that. I knew you were cut copying the IP address. I didn't know if you were also checking the property address. Yes. Now I understand. Yep. Yep. So there there could be duplicate entries, but we're hoping there hope we're hoping that there aren't too many. Um, so for instance, you could take you could use your um, your phone data and take the poll, which has a unique IP address. You not not through your Wi-Fi, not through your home um, data but through your phone data but if you have if you enter your address then we will know that there are two uh two votes for the same address with two different ip addresses um, and we'll have to analyze that manually does that make sense thank you yes that's definitely the way to do it sure um, so, but it, I do want to underscore uh, the the issue that we're concerned about based on the work group's feedback is that um, you had talked about helping your neighbors fill out the poll, and we just want to make sure that you understand that you can't, they will not be able to use your IP, your internet to fill out the poll. Um, they either have to use their internet or um, just send in a paper poll. And what we're going to do is collect all the paper ballots at the and then enter them at the end of the survey all at one time, um, all from the same IP address, but we'll have the code that allows us to do that. So we can have made multiple entries on the same IP address. Okay, great. Um, and some of this is just uh, repeated information from the last time the paper ballots are available in other languages, the three day turnaround. And, and again, as I stressed um, to Edith's question earlier about uh, the no opinions, we'll report everything. So uh, we'll report the anomalies, we'll report the duplicates, we'll report the um, no opinions. So everything you know, all the data will be available for you all to to analyze. So, and then we also have um, two owners that own two parcels. And um, in the you know spirit of fairness, we want to be able to give them their their two votes. So what we're going to do is um, send them the postcard and a letter explaining that they get two votes. Um, one can either, well, one can be cast uh, through the internet, but the other one will have to be mailed in, or they can have a choice of just mailing both of their votes in. So that's the way we've determined to do that. But as far as we, we know, there are only two people that own the two lots. Um, and I think, I think that's it. I'll let everybody sit for a second and think about if you have any questions about the the mailing or the poll or the questions or the postcard before we move on. No, it looks great and we appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Definitely a team effort. Denise, how um, Many of the ballots were requested in another language in Holland Hills. Grace, can you answer that? Um, to my knowledge, we did not offer it so outright. 
Um, I believe there was a way for people to translate the online poll into whatever language they needed, but we don't have access to that information. Okay. Thanks, Grace. And um, and I apologize. Uh, let me just stop right here and, and introduce Barbara Peters, um, who just chimed in and asked the question. Barbara is the um, History Commission representative for the Mason District. And uh, when you all switched to the Mason District, Barbara rotated onto um, this work group, but she, of course, had a conflict at this, the same time that we hold these work group meetings. So she's been keeping up by record through recording, um, watching the recordings of the meetings, but this is the first time that she's actually been able to attend. So I want to forgive me, Barbara, for not uh, introducing you at the beginning. I forgot all about it, but I wanted to take a second and just uh, welcome you to the the live version of this uh, work group. Well, and, and I'd just like to say I'm a neighbor. I live in Broyhill Crest and my children went to school at Woodburn Elementary. So I feel very connected to the Homes Run area. Thank you. Okay. So, Grace, do you want to um, speak to this slide? Sure. Sorry, Edith, did you have a question first? No, I was just welcoming Barbara and saying thank you. I'm I'm happy to have another uh, Woodburn parent in our mix. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the timeline for the postcard, we will send whenever we send it to the print shop, they'll take two to three days to flip it over to the mail room. We will take about a day to get it mailed out and um, the mail delivery could take anywhere from seven to 10 days. That is on the longer side, just um wanted to provide a little bit of an extra buffer in there because sometimes the post office isn't um and sometimes they have a little bit more issues um and then the poll will be open for four weeks and once it closes um staff will do the analysis um in about three to four weeks and then from then it'll take us about um eight to ten weeks to announce the results or from yeah, from the beginning to the end of the process. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. Sure. <laughs> um, and I think the reason that we wanted to go back over this timeline is that um, I know the work group had mentioned maybe having a week's pause in between um, when we come and present all the findings to the community at that larger community meeting to when we launch the poll, and we're. You know, we're kind of questioning that, and I just wanted to to talk talk it through with you all, because um, we have this like almost a full week of buffer time just based on the process of the print shop, the mail room, and mail delivery. Um, you know, I feel like if we if we had the work group meeting, um, excuse me, the community meeting and launch the poll the next day, it would be a good week before anybody even got a postcard in the mail. So I wanted to, to talk to you all about that, about maybe not putting in the extra week in between the community meeting and when we mail the postcards and just allowing the mail, the print shop mail room, mail delivery week to be our buffer week. I think there was some concern about um, having an opportunity to answer questions and get feedback after the community meeting. So what uh, what would you all feel about just shorting, shortening that timeline and, and um, after the community meeting, just going ahead and launching the poll, but knowing that it'll take seven, at least seven days for it to get into the hands of anybody? That makes sense to me, but <clears throat> I just have one question. Your timeline has this happening in the, the poll in August, is that correct? 
I let's see. Um, yes, August. Is there any concern about vacations? Any possibility or is it thought about moving it until right after Labor Day? I mean, that's an extra delay, and I don't know if we want to do that. But I thought I'd just raise the question. We have also had that same question, but but also was we were concerned about the delay as well. Oh, I, you know, I think in this neighborhood, um, historically, we don't convene in August for a multitude of things. So I like the idea of pushing it off into September. That said, does does the hot topic go cold if you delay? I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Well, why would it be any colder two weeks later, though, or three weeks later? The, what what heats it up will be the postcard and the meeting and the mailing mail materials. I'm going to go ahead and I advance the slide because we're kind of talking about the next slide. So go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say I think that the I think that as soon as the poll comes out, we're probably going to start seeing lists or posts and things like that. So, um, you know, I don't know if then that dies down and then all of a sudden it comes back. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I personally um, just. For my immediate, you know, truly personal um, reasons, would prefer it to be after Labor Day, because I also think that gives us a chance to um, discuss it in the community a little bit more. Patrick or Sarah, do you have thoughts? Not really. I think you could make the argument for either way. I mean, I, I don't think it's too dangerous either way. If if the feedback, if we get a very low response rate in June, I think we have to accept that people have just gone on perhaps their first normal summer vacation in three years, and it'll be a signal that, I mean, we sh it shouldn't move to the Planning Commission or Board of Supervisors until the fall at the earliest. Um, but maybe we get a lot of feedback and a lot of progress and a lot of comments on the overlay district. So as long as. As long as uh, as long as. Uh, a fairly meager response rate doesn't count against us. Um, and isn't a waste of all of your efforts. Mm. Um, I guess I would defer to the the whole group there. I, as people have said, there are advantages to waiting until the school year. There are also advantages to doing it as soon as possible. What about doing it as soon as possible, then extending the deadline if you get low response rate? Um, it, it, there's sort of a cascading effect here um, with, with the uh, with the timeline. So let me let me run through the timeline and then we can revisit this question about when when we should do the poll, the community meeting and the poll. Um, so what I had planned on is um, and let, let me just say I sent out the agenda and it says June 1st for the next or the last work group meeting it's supposed to be June 15th. That's the third Wednesday and I apologize for that. It was just a placeholder and I forgot to change it. But so June 15th um, and that would be to look over on. Um, all of the information, all of the materials in that public input website. So essentially, we'll make a mock up for you all to review so you can see it all to all put all together. And then um, as Patrick just I mean, uh, David, excuse me, David just alluded to. Um, the uh, there are, we, we all have vacations that we'd like to take, um, and some of them are in July. So we were going to push the community meeting off until the end of July. So not the third uh, Wednesday of July, but maybe the fourth Wednesday or the beginning of August. So that would be that community meeting and then open up the poll and we want to leave it open for four weeks. So that means that it ends the end of September. Let me advance the slide, which. OK. Um, which puts us at the beginning of October for the 
actual tabulation and the presentation of the poll results than that the publish the publication of the staff report in January, the planning commission and board of um, board of supervisors hearings in February. They're like back to back. The planning commission is early February and the board of hearing is late February. So if we if we push the poll off the community meeting and the poll off one month, then then all of this sort of moves. The whole thing just moves back one month, which is fine, um, but it, it's really what what your comfort level is with doing that. Well, for me, as long as the poll remains open for a period of time after Labor Day, we can do some additional uh, publicity here in the neighborhood to get people who might have been gone during the summer to pay attention to it and vote. <clears throat> it's the, my, my biggest concern was getting people to do the actual voting. And if they're not here, they can't do that. But if, if it remains open through most of September, that would take care of that issue. Or, you know, at least a couple weeks past Labor Day. Okay, so um, ah, you're you're back on that slide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, um, I would strongly advocate for the community meeting in the end of July rather than the beginning of August, because I know for parents with younger kids, all the camps kind of end in July. So, if there's one month people take for travel, I think it tends to be August, even more than June. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, end of July would be definitely be, be best for the community meeting if we're going to have I it agree. sometime. I agree completely. Okay, that works. I um, it, it, I think it's the twenty seventh. I think is the third. The oh, excuse me, the fourth Wednesday. Fourth Wednesday. Um, I can't do the third Wednesday because I will just be walking back from getting back from vacation. So I was going to push it off. Um. So that works for me. I have to check with the supervisor's office and make sure it works for them. And then, of course, convening a physically at a place. Um, and I know you all had talked about uh, Woodburn Elementary. I'm not sure that the, the schools are open during the summer and whether we can get that room, though. Does anybody know if we can um, if the schools will allow public meetings in their spaces over the summer? Well, we certainly can find out. We have very good relations with Woodburn. Okay. Uh, things are, are changing though. We, <laughs> we found out we have to, as a private organization, we have to have insurance and things like that that we've never had to have before. So uh, we do have to ask. <clears throat> so if you could close the poll, say on September 15th, instead of at the very beginning of September, that would probably take care of the uh, issue of voting. Okay, so I just hear just leaving it open for longer rather yeah. than, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm okay with that. How does everybody else feel with about that? Fine. I'm fine as well. David? Um, that works for me too. Okay. Okay, so um, rather than the poll closing the beginning of September, it will close mid-September. Um, staff team, did, do you see any fatal flaws with that? I do not, um, but I just wanna confirm that would be six weeks that it would be open. It sounds like it. Okay, um, I don't see any issues with that. This is Lily. I don't see any I, issues I either. Is, I think six weeks is fine because it's over summer. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. So our timeline doesn't change just the amount of time that we're going to leave the poll open. It, it might change a little bit. Instead of like the beginning of October, we come back. Well, we may be the middle of October that we're coming back to you all. But um, I don't think that will change the board date, um, which is tentative anyway. So um, I still think we'd be looking at uh, 
late February, early March for the board hearing. And I think Lily, did you have a comment? Uh, no comments. I didn't see any issues with the um, opening the poll for six weeks. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. You so much. Okay. I did have a question and it doesn't need to be answered um, today, but maybe um, the next time we're together, we can discuss who we are going to be providing the poll results to, whether that means like a full community meeting or whether we'll just be coming back, say to the Civic Association and reporting back to the Civic Association. Um, it's just something to think about. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we have a, a an idea because a a full community meeting is a lot to you know to coordinate as as we just talked about. Um, we're a, a smaller group, uh, and specifically the group that we're responding to um, might be easier. It, um, but it. It's okay if you want to do a full community meeting. It's just something that we have to plan for. How did you do it for Holland Hills? Uh, Grace, can you answer that? Sorry, can you repeat the question? <clears throat> How did you report the results to Holland Hills? We did not uh, report the results directly to the community. Um, we did report the, result, the results to the work group. Um, and anyone could call into that meeting if they chose to. That certainly sounds like a reasonable way to do it. Okay. All right, thank you. Great. And this is just some uh, more information about the community meeting. And we've gone over this before, um, what, what will be presented th at that time. Okay. Okay. Um, so we resolved a lot there. Now we're going to talk about um, the final issue, that because the boundaries, because we haven't talked about those sort of um, outliers in the um, Holmes Renicker community. So the first... Um, the first thing, this is a map of the study area boundary. Um, the area essentially just includes uh, the boundary of um, from Gallows Road uh, all the way back to uh, Loria Park um, and the, the full boundaries of um, Homes Run Acres, which also the study area boundary also included the upper executive homes um, the three homes on Gallows Road that right here um, that sit in front of the that elementary school lot. And then the second parcel that's owned by the um, rec center. And these are just kind of explaining um, the National Register boundaries compared to um, the study area boundaries. So just based on addresses, the National Register boundaries um, did not include, or you can see these white areas over here. Um, these are Fairfax County Park Authority lots. Um, and then we have the two out lots where people own two lots uh, here by the park and here in the uh, northwest, essentially northwest corner. And then um, FCPS's second lot that's associated with the school here, the rec centers, uh, a rec recreation association's second lot that's associated with the pool here. These three lots on Gallows Road, that front Gallows Road, and then the um, homes that have been, we've been referring to uh, uh, as the homes on Epper Executive here. Okay, so uh, Woodburn Elementary School, um, 
it was uh, course constructed in 1953 and de determined eligible um, as a contributing structure if, for the um, National Register in uh, the Homes Run Acres District. And I'm just going to um, leave this open for work group input as to whether, you know, what you think about the school now, whether you still feel that it contributes to the Homes Run Acres District. Um, there have been several additions to the school uh, throughout its history, but um, as we were just referencing, it's still a, sort of an integral part of the daily life of Homes Run Acres. Uh, Edith can probably offer more background. I, I believe you were the PTA president before the renovation. Um, no, I was there after. So I, um, my first child entered the year after renovations were completed. And, you know, I don't think there's much recognizable left of the original homes run um, acres, you know, Woodburn mm -hmm. Elementary. But I do think that keeping it in the historic overlay district would be beneficial if we do get to the point where we have um, height restrictions and things like that. So in other words, if, you know, the, homes, the Woodburn Elementary School, the way it is now, um, you know, is a much more welcome um, scale and, and yeah, building in general than something twice the size would be. So, you know, I'm not sure how much relevance there is though if the county decides that suddenly there's you know if, if we do continue to sort of urbanize um fairfax county and we do away with r1 and r2 and r3 zoning and we end up with a much more dense environment obviously it's going to put pressure on the school and you know i don't know how that all shakes out and i'm not sure if the historic overlay district would prevent that from happening so i guess what i'm asking is does it make sense to incorporate it in the in the historic overlay district so that it precludes tripling in size should the rest of the county move in that direction because if we're holding the houses to the um kind of the ratio of more land to building then it would be nice that the school that's in the middle of all these houses retain that same ratio so that would be my take on it but um you know i mean i think that in terms of it Spirit, it's definitely more in the spirit of a um, Homes Run Acres, um, you know, edifice because it's got the big garden in the back and that kind of thing. So it's really connected in that regard as well. And it really, you know, there's no buffer between us and the school. The school is truly in the middle of the neighborhood, and it was in fact built for this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'd be in favor of it in the historic overlay district. It's just it's difficult because it's, you know. By the letter of the law, it's probably non-contributing. Yeah. Oh, I have a practical question. When they do things to the school, does it have to go through the regular permitting process, the ARB and the like? Because if it doesn't, then it doesn't really matter whether it's in the HOD or not. Well, that's that's why the HOD I think is so important because you do want to guarantee that 60 years from now or 20 years from now when the next renovation occurs that um that it does go through the ARB yeah but does it does it go through any permitting process of course it's just because just because FCPS is public um there's still the same types of okay that's all hearings, I was asking. but if it's um so i mean if do you have to get the schools, uh, the school systems permission to put it in the HOD? We do have to go to the uh, school board. They will receive our staff report in our recommendation and make comment. I, I will tell you that the schools um, did not uh, did not join the um, historic overlay district for Holland Hills. Mm -hmm. Do they have an elementary school that's as uh, integrated into their neighborhood as ours? They do. Uh -huh. So did they 
did you ask about it or was that just a decision that was never that was never considered um i i don't i i know that the, if the question was asked i don't know how the staff report was written hmm. Um, I guess my argument is, I mean, the schools are a bureaucracy and I mean, neighborhood compatibility is one of the last considerations on the list and and reading up on the neighborhood. I mean, one of the first things the Fairfax County Public Schools did when they got the Woodburn Elementary tract is they tried to clear cut all the trees away. Mm -hmm. And so the the Civic Association went straight to Superintendent Woodson and got them to stop the work crews and they kept the trees in, in keeping with the values of the community. But the while the school board generally does a good job and of course is elected and has hearings, it's better that they get this right in the early stages of the project rather than having a flood of school board hearing. So I think it'd be perfectly great to put it in. I just don't want to get the whole process screwed up by getting some other big bureaucracy fighting it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it is, I mean, it's at a key entry to the schools and government agencies, I mean, are, I mean, we would like, I mean, if you look at that intersection, I mean, there are, parties and developers who want traffic lights there. There's right. express lanes infrastructure right on school property. I mean, if you have a historic overlay district, they might have not put that sign up there, which is. And that sign incidentally would have gone in someone's front yard, uh, so that as as ugly as the sign in your photo is mm -hmm. it's up there on the school property because neighbors fought to not have it on their own property. Right. So, I mean, that sign right there is case in point why you want this property under a historic overlay. Has anybody actually asked the school? I have spoken with the school system, yes. They have not um, responded, of, you know, officially. I've just let them know that we have a historic overlay district being considered um, in that it was, you know, of course, identified uh, in the National Register as con a contributing property. Knowing that there have been, you know, multiple changes to the edifice, uh, you know, it probably would be considered non-contributing, but, you know, we, we were still, it was in the study and we would be making a recommendation. I mean, I think the bottom line is that we really would like, like the additional oversight that an ARB would afford just because it can slow the process down long enough to try to talk reason about certain aspects. A lot of the people making the decision, you know, about an addition for Woodburn Elementary School are sitting in an office somewhere, probably have never even been on site. So I, that kind of thing, I think, really helps if you can anything that kind of slows people down and goes, hey, just, you know, just give us a breather here to to help you accomplish your goals, Fairfax County Public School, without destroying the character that everybody has enjoyed. Um, you know, the other thing is that the school uses the neighborhood quite a bit for certainly SAC and other things um, because it is a, you know, because the park is lovely and kids go on walks and, mm. you know, identify plants in people's yards and things like that. So it's actively used um, by the school. So, there, so there's there a, been his, yeah. Forgive well, me, go ahead. The neighborhood, the neighborhood founded the PTA, the neighborhood uh, seated the first library. Um, there's been a long history of connection between the citizens, the residents of the neighborhood and the school. Um, so, you know, when we, when we first, I did a little nation garden club when I was at Woodburn and it was, Parents of kids outside of the community did not come, but um, parents of kids in the community and, you know, people who have had kids for decades came to help, um, you know, dig plants in and things like that. So there's, you know, I'd hate to lose that, I guess. Um, I just, I, I guess what I don't know to Keith's point is 
does Fairfax County Public School, because it is a large, you know, albeit a public entity, but a large client, um, do they just have the muscle to go, yeah, yeah, whatever, and we're just not going to listen, and so we're going to do whatever we want? It, in other words, did, the fact that they didn't join Holland Hills was at a point of contention, and they just sort of said, forget it, or did Holland Hills kind of just go, it's not going to happen, so we're not even going to try? You know, um, I, I'll have to go back and check. I don't know what the dynamic was that, um, you know, ultimately led them not to be included. Um, so it could have been that, you know, it, I, I just the just the non-contributingness of this building. But you know, for instance, um, it's it would be easy to leave it out because it is right. on the outside of the boundaries then that's why this is the boundary question you right. know do it's certainly non-contributing um i don't know you know i i don't know what the architectural review board would say about you know any changes that come in to it because it is a non-contributing building and do we just you know draw a line around it rather than including it well, it I has the. Oh, I think you need to include it, and I think we want it to be assessed within the character. I mean, there were a few of us who tried to push the county into, you know, once we saw the design of the school. I mean, again, as an architect, I, you know, there there are some minimal gestures that wouldn't have cost anything that would have brought it a little bit more in keeping with the the architecture of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and it was just sort of that ship sailed and you know move on. So. I, I just, uh, you know, I think sometimes, sometimes there's a little bit more room for compromise if somebody's required to come to the table. I think the difference between us and Holland Hills is this is, I mean, a main entrance to the neighborhood, and it's part of the, it's part of the viewshed from so many places in the neighborhood. I mean, mm -hmm. to say it's on the edge of the neighborhood, yes, sort of, but it's the neighbor. It's a neighbor to the pool, which is another major focal point of activity. It's where you sit in traffic for 15 minutes every morning, mm -hmm. entering Homes Run Acres. Um, and I mean, the school property stretches very far into the neighborhood. Fortunately, a lot of it is, is under conservation easement, regardless of whether there's the HOD. Mm. Um, but just having that conversation means that the next renovation of the school will be a better product than if we didn't have it. And it's it's the entrance to the neighborhood. And it, I don't want to overstate the extent to which the it's historic, but it 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 was built contemporaneously with the neighborhood. It was also the Woodburn PTA was also the first. PTA in the county to endorse integration of schools in um, in a time where there was a large black population locally and a segregation of school board. Um, unfortunately, we've my understanding is the building looked a little bit like a Holmes Run Acres house in the beginning, and we've lost that architecture. But the landscaping, the gateway to the community, and just I mean, it's been where every community meeting and election and a lot of people's church meetings have been held in Holmes Run Acres for 70 years. I think, uh, I mean, the, I think as Edith hinted, the, the renovation suffered from not being under historic overlay in 2009. And, um, and without uh, the ARB status, the really the only consideration that's going to drive the next renovation is ingress and egress from Gallows Road. And that means maybe more parking, maybe more paving. Um, I, I definitely think you want the ARB uh, reviewing that next renovation, even, even if it's half a century from now. I mean, I do too. I worked on a middle school in Arlington County that I did this just crossed. I just completely forgot about this Arlington County that had been in a historic 
um, overlay. I'm not sure if it was a historic overlay, but it was re it was required. I'm not sure how we got to that point, but it was required to be historically synthetic, and it was unlike any other school that I had worked on because we had to toe the line. In fact, that's why I was brought on board to toe the line to make it historically synthetic and have that mandate not be, you know ended up being a good school. They got everything they wanted, um, but the architecture of it just ended up being more sympathetic than had it not gone through that oversight, had it not been mandated to go through that. So I, you know, for, you know, that that's just an example of Swanson Middle School. It's an example of the, the first school that was proposed, the, the addition that was proposed would have changed the character of that school 100%. And, um, and instead, they ended up again with the, the product that they wanted and the, the square footage that they wanted, but they ended up with the school that they that they all agreed to. So, and that again would not have happened had it not been required to happen. So, I'm a big fan of these things for that reason because I think that it's just it's imagination that's the difference, not not anything else. And that's kind of what you're asking people to do is be slightly more imaginative when you put a historic overlay district on something. So, I mean, I, I strongly think we should include it. I just don't know how that works with the county and the school board, um, whether that's even something that they would entertain. Right, okay. Well, thanks for the discussion. Yeah. Where does it go from here? I mean, what what could we meet with? Does it make sense to meet with our school board and say, hey, look, you guys might not know the history of this and that's fine, but we just want to let you know why this is important to us as a community. I mean, is that something that we can take on ourselves? Is it useless? Where, where uh, do you, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I know from staff's perspective, we um, will be reviewing at, in, in, including your input, you know what the what the work group has said. Um, we'll be looking at this and reviewing it, and we'll be going back to the school system and talking to them as well. We we're going to get to the park authority in a minute, but um, the same process will happen with the park authority as well. Um, talking to them about Luria Park and putting whether that is included and and how they feel about that. Um, so that the say a same process will happen with them okay again thanks very much for that discussion um i think that could go either way but i i i do hear your questions about um it, it, it's included in the boundaries and we will study it and make a recommendation i appreciate that Sure. Okay, um, so the next uh, item on the list was to talk about the uh, recreation center. Um, again, very similar, you know, uh, constructed, uh, well, at least the first pool um, was constructed at the same time as the um, the beginnings of the Homes Run Acres neighborhood. Um, again, it, as you alluded to, it's directly adjacent to the school. So we have um, that uh, interplay of school and, um, and and recreation together right on the boundary of um, Homes Run Acres against Gallows Road. Um, there is a second pool added. It's had some renovations. Um, but as far as I can tell, um, it's still it's sympathetic. Um, it, it, it's stylistic to Homes Run Acres. I was not, um, I think this photo was taken like over the fence. We didn't go down and, um, you know, walk around um, the, but, you know, we stood in the parking lot and, and took this photo. And then um, the other thing that I wanted to point out with the, is this great pathway, which you all had mentioned, and I had an opportunity to, um, Grace and I went out and walked up this um, stairs up to the uh, rec center. It's a really cool feature that you have in this neighborhood. So I wanted to put this out there um, for to, to, so to talk about it. Go ahead. I'm going to chime in for a second. So I think the rec center is, I mean, it has to be included. So the mm -hmm. building, 
I wish Arvidas were on the call right now because the building on the property was designed by Arvidas, who's oh. still in our neighbor. Um, the first pool was hand dug by parents of this neighborhood. Um, in fact, Luria Park, same thing. It was people in this neighborhood who got together and said that shouldn't be a dump site for construction fill. Can you level it off and turn it into a park? So all of the, you know, the rec center, the school, as I said, the PTA, the library, the first sort of aftercare center, um, and the and Luria Park are all absolutely integrally uh, woven into this neighborhood. Okay. Anybody else have thoughts about it? I just wanted to add, and that pathway is fabulous. And if you come back in the summer, it is, it's a highway of kids going between mm -hmm. the neighborhood and the, uh, and the tennis court. I bet. I mean, it what, was, what threat would it be under if it was not included in an HOD? Like, I don't, I don't see anyone developing over that area, would they? Well, a scenario could be that the rec center is no longer solvent. It sells the property and it goes to the highest bidder. I do whatever they want. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. What about bringing the rec Recreation Association in on this? I don't think it'd be fair to spring it on them without any knowledge that they're going to be included because that does have an impact on them as a private corporation. Was the Recreation Association, they weren't involved in the original um, canvassing? Uh, many of them do not live in the acres, so they would not have been uh, part of that original poll. Uh, but also the pool wasn't pulled as a parcel, so right. there was no, although most, but not all of the membership lives within the acres. The, I think there was no suggestion that we were thinking of including the pool in it. So even those in the acres who were voting in favor, would have been thinking about their own homes. They wouldn't have been thinking about the pool. I strongly agree the pool would be great to include it. I just worry about springing a complete surprise on them. So I think, Keith, I think you're right. I mean, I think we need to bring them up to speed and quick. I yeah. can talk to a couple, I know a couple people there. So I can talk to the board. They're not, I don't know if they're convening right now, but. Okay. So Edith, I think I should also reach out just um, to, to let yep. them know where we are in this stage. It, um, maybe yep. you and I could talk uh, or just um, email back and forth and uh, get their contact information. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thanks. I had not, uh, I had not realized they were not part of the initial conversations. I frankly didn't either. I thought we had, uh, David, I, I, I thought that we had spoken with was it Mark Sites or somebody when we... Um, I'm not privy to any of that. I mean, I would have thought that people might have discussed this informally. Um, right. But I don't think there was any formal discussion. I mean, maybe everyone just thought Arvidas would tell... Um, um, Danius. Um, Danius. Yeah, Danius. And right. Exactly. But I don't think yeah. that conversation actually happened and we shouldn't assume that okay. it happened. Okay. No, I think that's fair. So I think we should reach out to them. Okay. So, yeah, just as I've reached out to the public school systems and the park authority, um, uh, they, they, they definitely do need uh, um, some contact. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And, and for, upper, for upper executive, I just wanted to put out there because I'm still on the phone, not in front of a computer, so I don't look, I can't see your diagram, so I don't know where you're moving to mm -hmm. next. But the, there is we're, a we're resident at, we're there. We're at the park. If you, if you want to oh. hold just for a second, because we, we'll nope. just, because I think we're going to cover the park pretty quickly because we've, I think, you know, we've already had a lot of discussion about it um, tangentially, and then we're going to move to upper executive. So, so um, 
The park, uh, another nice, really nice feature of um, your neighborhood, you know, uh, sort of um, tucked tucked way back in there, which um, helps it, gives it the secluded feeling that it has and truly a neighborhood park. Um, and I just heard that the school children use it and I know that you all have community events there. So obviously, you know, a, a very pivotal um, touch point for your your neighborhood. Um, and I know when I was walking around there, there was a group of moms that were meeting at the playground, which, you know, just, you know, I don't know if it was a formal meeting, but there was a, you know, a group of moms with the, with toddlers. Um, so, uh, you know, cl clearly well used by the neighborhood and, and, um, and, and liked by the neighborhood. So, but I wanted to get the work groups input on it as well. Yeah, as I said, I mean, the, the park wouldn't exist without yeah. residents who asked for it, nor would the tot, what they used to call the tot lot, so the little playground with the structures in it, that was also um, initiated by residents of Homes Run Acres. Uh, it's got to be included if it's humanly possible. The, okay. uh, the neighborhood built the first uh, playground there, too. Yeah, the I think um, how many the the neighborhood I mean put it together in the fifties and the sixties I think it was like something like a fifteen or twenty year period, um, but it was both built and planned by the residents. It's uh, uh, we we talk about a lot of our historic firsts in the neighborhood and. Some of them, I wonder if they really were the first, but Luria Park was one of the first parks in the county. The, there was just no investment in parks at the time Holmes Earn Acres was built. Mm. It's really a project that the the neighborhood pushed for and the developer donated because the, the land was in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. It also, uh, I think, contributes to the natural landscape because there it is still, you know, they do have this um, field, but you also have a lot of mature trees and it gives you all a buffer um, from the, uh, you know, the neighbor neighboring neighborhoods. We actively manage that. So from time to time, um, there are people who champion the planting there, the removal of invasives. We've mm -hmm. worked with Earth to remove it invasives. Um, so, you know, a lot of the new trees, a, a lot of the sycamores along the water that was planted by uh, committees um, in the neighborhood who wanted to, you know, there was just a lot of erosion going on. So the, the thought was to stabilize the banks there. Um, the river birches that are down around the corner, um, same thing. So right now we have some stakes up because there's a little bit of a pond where we get tadpoles every year. So mm. that's another, you know, resident led effort. So um, it's definitely, it's definitely a gathering and recreation point for the neighborhood. And it's been, it's been part and parcel of it since the inception of the neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, so Edith, we are now turning to uh, the homes on the the three homes on Gallows Road that sit um, in front of the elementary school lot, and then um, the what we are terming the upper executive, the homes on upper executive. So I think you had something that you wanted to to say. Yeah. So I have nothing to say about the three houses that front Gallows Road, um, but the houses that are on upper executive. There apparently, I have not circled back to the resident who reached out to me and said, hey, I'd love to help you get the word out on Upper Executive. Um, she herself is not in a uh, typical Homes Run Acres home, but she lives next door to a house that was another one of the little Cape Cods that predate actually the, the HRA homes um, that was torn down and turned into a big home. And she is very much a proponent for um, including upper executive in the HOD for for that so that something like that could potentially not happen. So she's interested in it for the scale, for the focus on green, for the natural environment, the character of the neighborhood. 
that said, she's the one who reached out to me and said, you know, there was a petition, I think early on, that never made it to me or to us in general. Um, a few people on Upper Executive had run a petition to say, we're not interested in being part of the HOD. So she was going to try to get to the bottom of who was the author of that, where did it go, because to her knowledge, it hasn't been shared with anybody. Because I asked her, I said, you know, I never saw it. Did, it. did it get lost in the mail somewhere? Has it gone to the county? Did they post it to the website? I was just trying to find out where it is and any color on it. So that's out there. It, that means that there are people, I don't know how many, who are against joining the HOD in, on Upper Executive. But as I said, until I reach back out to this neighbor and really kind of sit down and see what she has to say, I, I won't know. I won't know what's going on in that area. So again, I, I can't tell you whether it's a majority or whether it's a vocal min minority. Okay, thank you. Um, I will say, I think I might have mentioned this the last time we were talking about um, the Homes on Upper Executive that somebody did call uh, and left a message for me. Uh, I returned the phone call, but I didn't hear back from them, but they said that they were a homeowner in this um, in this group of homes. And although they had signed the petition for the historic overlay district or uh, to, to do the study, um, they had not realized that that included their home and they did not want to be in it. So um, I don't know the address. But, um, I did return the phone call. Like I said, I haven't actually spoken to the the person personally, but I did get that message. So. Okay, well, I'll for I, I think I must have missed that or I might have missed the meeting where you shared that. So I will when I reach back out to this resident, I'll mention that and just mm -hmm. see if we can you know, get to the bottom because it might be that it's just two houses at the very tippy top or something like that. I have no idea. I just don't know what percentage of those houses feel that way. Okay. All right. Um, so again, it is they the homes are in the study area along with those the three homes on uh, the front gallows road um, in front of this the school lot. We'll talk. Um, I found the original subdivision plat. Um, from 1948 that um, actually platted the homes on Executive Avenue and it actually um, plats the road as well. Um, so here it is. And just going in uh, numerical order. Um, so the these homes were not um, designed uh, or built by any of the any of the three builders in Homes Run Acres. And again, they're not typical Homes Run Acres homes. They don't have uh, the same style, architectural style, um, and they don't didn't necessarily take advantage of the topography the way um, the other Homes Run Acres, typical Homes Run Acres homes um, do. They're sort of laid out in that standard front facing, um, road facing um, site design. So the first one, uh, 3419 Executive Avenue, was built in 1952 by H. Sheldon, who is a builder for um, Homes, Homes Run Construction Company. Uh, 3420 was also built by Sel uh, Selden in 1950. 21, uh, Dwight Dodd was built in 1952. Uh, 22, again, um, Dwight Dodd in 1952. 23, 52, uh, Mr. Dodd. 24, 52, Mr. Dodd. 25, well, the original was demolished, and this is um, was a home and built in uh, 2015. 26, um, 1950, whoops, sorry. 1950, here, 26, um, by a, a development company called Westward Properties. Uh, 3427, um, 1952, Dodd. 3428, 1952, James Costello was the builder. 3429, um, 1952, Dodd. 
3430-1952, Greenspan and Grimm. 3431, um, 1950, Selden. 3433-1949, Selden. 3435-1949, Selden. 3465 Gallows Road, 1952, Greenspan and Grimm. 3467 Gallows Road, 1952, A Builder Unknown, these the last two, and 3405 Gallows Road, 1948, Unknown. So those are the homes on Upper Executive. Um, and I did that very quickly, mostly because I'm not there's not much to say to relate them to Holmes Ren Acres Homes um, and to this historic overlay district. I understand that they are adjacent to um, what was developed and what has been um, recognized and uh, honored with the National Register nomination. I just, I don't see them as being in any way associated uh, besides for proximity and perhaps scale to the homes run acres, homes that have been included in the National Register nomination and would be included in a historic overlay district. They're I just, would agree that yeah. they would belong only as a buffer and with the consent of the residents. Um, but a lot of overlay districts do have that buffer. And uh, the scale would be a good argument for, but I, I think. I think the buffer is nice to have and that maybe the. The choice of the individual residents might be the. Um, the basis on which we decide to have that buffer or not. Well, again, keep in mind that um, our historic registry is based on the neighborhood, not any individual house. And so I think in that context, those houses, when you drive into the neighborhood, because they, again, present nature first, house second, for the most part, that that component of them does fit within the character of the acres, though the houses themselves do not. This looks to me like a clear case where you ask those houses, and if a significant number of them want to be in, you include them, and if they don't, you don't. I think that's a completely reasonable way to pursue it. Agreed. Okay, so the next houses are those three, and um, I have to apologize in advance. Um, <laughs> we clearly just ignored them. Um, so I realized when I was putting together my slideshow, I didn't have any pictures of these houses. Um, I guess just because they're just so obviously not. Um, not within keeping in the character of the Holmes Run Acres style. So these are the three that front Gallows Road, the 3441, 3443, and 3445 built uh, in 2016, 2018, and 2019 by Millennium Investments. And the original homes were demolished. I think there were two homes that they might've made three lots out of. Um, yeah, they so, were built on the cinder blocks. <laughs> the two yeah. Homes were demolished. yeah, I don't think the, the original homes were, were um, <laughs> homes, Rain Acres homes either. Oh. They, they were not. Yeah. But they were dramatically smaller in scale. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, these are done, a done deal. I would say just leave them be and leave them out. Agreed. 
anything that makes them easier to tear down, <laughs> I'm in favor of. So they don't need to go the ARB. In the... No, I agree. I think that one's a pretty easy one. Yeah. yeah. We we well we we obviously we just ignored them. I now I have to go back and get real <laughs> pictures of them. I was like, oh darn. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Okay, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I I for, I did not mean to do that. I'm still sharing the screen. There we go. There was a, they're just going to the, the next slide. Okay. So thank you very much for that uh, conversation and um, your contributions to that. That's a this one's um, I don't know just tougher uh, with those with that group of homes and I appreciate your input on it. So the next um, work group meeting is scheduled for June fifteenth. Um, I need about six weeks to put all of those things together that I discussed at the beginning of the meeting that go into public input. So we'll have um, the boundary page, the list of contributing and non-contributing structures, um, the draft zoning ordinance text and um, rezoning. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other things that we have that we have to do, but it's essentially the the whole package, uh, the draft of the whole package, and that will come back to the this group um, one last time for your review on June fifteenth. So that we're going to skip the month of May and meet in June. If that is agreeable to everybody. Yep, agreed. Sounds fine to me. Works works for me. I've got some graduates happening, so I need to. May's going to be a tough one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and David, are you good with that? Yes, that works for me. Okay. Great. And I, I apologize. I think I was calling you Patrick earlier, and then I realized that uh, my my mistake. So I do apologize for that. Um, so what I'll do is reach out to the supervisor's office um, with a revised timeline, um, look for a date in late July to hold that community meeting, um, and then come back to the work group in June 15th with um, more firm dates for the community meeting after talking with the supervisor. So are you going to check with the school about a summer meeting or would you like us to do that? I, I think I'm going to uh, speak with the supervisor's office and I think we will be um, conducting the community meeting. And I understand that you all have some insurance hurdles that you have to would have to uh, yeah overcome. So let me reach out to the supervisor's office and see if we can get uh, scheduled with the schools. That would be great. Sure. Yeah. Helpful, because um, the other thing is you had mentioned earlier whether you know asked whether the school was closed and it's not actually during the summer there are camps there and there are both um, academic camps. Well, that changes year by year, but historically there have been academic camps there, so kids basically in summer school, but they don't call that anymore. And then um, also athletic camps, and then they I have also seen like what looks like older people going in to play basketball. So I do think that the facility has some sort of um, programming in the summer. Okay, great, good to know. Um, so Kay, I, I now am no longer sharing my screen and I can see people's hands are raised. I, I do apologize I, I, if, I, if I missed your hand being raised. I see Kay has her hand raised. Um, am I muted or unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay. Um, I, I just heard in passing with comments that we will be holding people to a land to building ratio. And uh, that is not the case. That is an Arlington County um, thing. And Fairfax does not have a, a yeah, ratio. Are. Yeah. And so um, people can build to their setbacks by right so um anyway and there is we as the arb cannot stop them from building to their setbacks that's their legal right 
So I think, and I apologize, this is Edith, I think the confusion stems from my use of the word ratio. What I meant by that is that the, the character of this neighborhood, when you drive into this neighborhood, is nature first, building second. It's very, very obvious. And when you come down executive, that character is still there. Um, so maybe that's the better way of explaining it. When I said ratio of, of nature to building, I meant it in the context of the character of the neighborhood, not any FAR specific to any property. So yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Kay. I, I appreciate that uh, that clarification and that input. Um, so, Edith, I think your hand is up, but I, I think probably that's. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Over, I'm not sure if I know how to put it down. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, if there. are are no other questions or let me just say, are there any other questions or thoughts? Okay. So June 15th, um, we'll, we'll get a, we'll send out a hold the date um, and to get on your calendars and then um, be back in touch. And Edith, I'll follow up with you on the uh, rec center contact. Okay, and I will also reach out to the resident on Upper Executive. Terrific. All right. All right, Thank folks. You. Thanks Thank so much. You. All right. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Take care.